Good evening. Great to see you all. We're going to walk through Psalm 66. So that's the text. I was told that I can ramble. So I gave it up for Lent. But we're not in Lent anymore. So get ready. That's my introduction. Psalm 66. We also don't have verses up here. So I am going to do my best to also slow down a little bit when there are references. So if you have a Bible or a phone, we're going to, uh, we're going to go through and look at each verse. There's nothing on the screen. So I'm going to just read Psalm 66. Shout, to the, shout for joy to God all the earth. Sing the glory of his name. Give to him glorious praise. Say to God, how awesome are your deeds. So great is your power that your enemies come cringing to you. All the earth worships you and sings praises to you. They sing praises to your name. Come and see what God has done. He is awesome in his deeds toward the children of man. He turned the sea into dry land. They passed through the river on foot. There did we rejoice in him who rules by his might forever, whose eyes keep watch on the nations. Let not the rebellious exalt themselves. Bless our God, O peoples. Let the sound of his praise be heard, who has kept our soul among the living and has not let our feet slip. For you, O God, have tested us. You have tried us as silver is tried. You brought us into the net. You laid a crushing, backs, uh, crushing burden on our backs. You let men ride over our heads. We went through fire and through water, yet you have brought us out to a place of abundance. I will come to your house with burnt offerings. I will perform my vows to you. That which my lips uttered when my mouth promised, and my mouth promised when I was in trouble. I will offer to you burnt offerings of fattened animals with the smoke of the sacrifice of rams. I will make an offering of bulls and goats. Come and hear all you who fear God, and I will tell you what he has done for my soul. I cried to him with my mouth, and high praise was on my tongue. If I had cherished iniquity in my heart, the Lord would not have listened. But truly, God has listened. He has attended to the voice of my prayer. Blessed be God, because he has not rejected my prayer or removed his steadfast love for me. Pray, Lord. Please make us worshipers, make us men and women who praise you, who make us a people who are able to quickly and habitually come to you and declare your name and your praises to ourselves, to each other, and to our world. Please make us, make that a, a rhythm and a habit of our lives. In the name of Jesus, amen. So initially, when, we, when, we don't have a, when we're not going through a specific book of the Bible, I'm always, and I, and I hear any preacher, I'm always curious, why do you, do you pick the text that you picked? If it's, not in a seri if it's not going through something, I'm always interested, what's motivating this message? I've been meditating a lot on, on repentance, what it means, what it looks like and prayer and how those two things are very related and there's a cool verse in this in this psalm verse 18 if i had cherished iniquity in my heart the lord would not have listened so then i thought the sermon was going to be about we can't hold on to sin in our lives because then god won't hear our prayer which is true that's just not the point of this psalm exactly it is a sub point and we'll touch it very quickly but the ta what this psalm is about is praising god and how it is necessary for God to hear praise and for us to praise him. Those are the two, basically the two takeaways that I hope that we all walk away with is that we, we praise God all the time for him and for us. So our, our news cycles, Fox, CNN, all of these things, they, they seem to run from catastrophe to catastrophe and our society catastrophizes everything. And then when we get sick of one, we look for the next one. And especially in this cultural milieu, 
praising God is really important for the world. It's important for us, important to God, important for the world, because as, as meaning is removed from words, as right and wrong, there's no, as there's no such thing to right and wrong, and that's happening at an increasing rate, there's no stability, and the only thing that we can actually rest on is the character and nature of God. So, let's just start in verse one and see how does the psalmist, how does he, how does he what does it mean to praise God? So, shout for joy to God all the earth. We're just going to go verse one through four. That's the first section. Shout for joy to God all the earth. Sing the glory of his name. Give him glorious praise. A lot of Psalms start with, for, for, with phrases like this. Psalm 19 says, the heavens declare the glory of God. Psalm 29, ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Psalm 135, praise the name of the Lord. Give praise, O servants of the Lord. And there's a lot of phrases in scripture that, especially growing up in the church or being around the church, hearing sermons, we, there are these phrases that don't, they, see, they sound like very much Christian phrases, like Bible phrases, like, but what does this actually mean? What does it mean to praise God? What are we supposed to say when we praise God? Is praising God what we go around at our church when anything good happens or any thought, someone says something that's, you know, that we agree with, praise God, that's kind of our thing here. What exactly is, what does it mean to praise God? The, this, thankfully the psalmist gives us an example. Praising God in a manner befitting our creator and totally sovereign king is not a light task. So let's just see what he does. So we see verse one and two, he gives us the command verse th to praise God. Verse three, say to God, how awesome are your deeds. So great is your power that your enemies come cringing to you. All the wor earth worships you and they sing praises to you. They sing praises to your name. So what we're supposed to say is, as we praise God to obey this command, we're supposed to say, God, I praise you because your deeds are awesome. The things that you do are worthy of recognition. It's a statement of fact. You are so, for example, we would say, you are so powerful that your enemies come whimpering before you. And the world worships you. Pastor John talked about this a little bit. They, wor they worship God against their will by the mere fact, God, as we pray, they sleep and you do not. We are recognizing to him the truth about his power. These declarations of fact are for God. They are for God. He loves when his people praise him because he is the only one worth praising. He is the God worthy of worship. There are many gods, many competing gods, but they, are, they don't talk, they don't speak, they don't do anything because they are not worthy of any worship. On the other hand, praising God is also for us. So again, as we heard this morning, Romans 4.20 says about Abraham, no unbelief made him waver concerning the promise of God, but he grew strong in his faith as he did what? What did he do to grow his faith? He gave glory to God, fully convinced that God was able to do what he promised. So how, is pr how does praise prevent pride and fuel faith as it did for Abraham? How does it actually work? When we give glory to God, we out loud affirm that God is worthy of praise for his overwhelming greatness and our perspective becomes washed clean. When we preach to ourselves and to others that the Lord's enemies come cringing to him and they don't come cringing to us, we are reminded that we are very small and weak and God is very big and he's very strong. Our faith in his character grows as we declare his character to him, to others and ourselves as we remind ourselves of his awesome and mighty deeds. I want to make the distinction that praising God is not thanking God. They're similar, but they're different. And we only really tend to confuse them when we're praying and when we're talking to the Lord. So if, for example, you're going to ask me, hey, can you come pray for X, Y, Z thing? We're going to start community group. We're going to whatever. Can you just pray? Because we do that at church here. Pray a lot, which is good. We should pray. I would say something like, I would say, like I've said pretty much my whole life, Lord, thank you for this day. Thank you for giving us a place to meet here. Please help us understand your word. Give us hearts of repentance. All good things. We should, these are all prayers of gratitude and we should be praying them. But why is it that Jesus started the Lord's prayer by addressing the Father first as sovereign Lord, saying, our Father in heaven, make your name holy in the earth. Hallowed be your name. 
your kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. Then he teaches us to come to God as provider. Give us this day our daily bread. It's very easy for us and natural for us to come to God as provider. Thank you for doing this or that. Thank you for giving me the breath in my lungs. And again, we should be grateful. We should recognize that he is every good thing comes from above. That is a biblical thing. But for some reason, I find it rare to meet men and women who praise the Lord in their speech and in their prayers on a regular basis. Remembering that praising God is declaring his greatness with no other purpose than stating the true fact about who he is. So as I was meditating on this psalm, I tried an experiment beginning every, every so it was, yeah, a couple weeks ago I said, you know, I'm going to try to do this. Before I go to bed, I pray before I go to bed, and I challenged myself to praise God at the beginning of my prayer, as Jesus does here in the psalms command us to do. And it started going okay, but then I would get a few sentences in and I'd start saying things like, I praise you because I have a great community. I praise you because you've given us your word, which is the solid rock. And again, those are good things. But why is it so hard to praise God apart from ourselves, from anything that it has to do with us? And why do we confuse the whole praise and thanks thing? If we're going to praise God, it's not a statement about us. Thanking him is. But God's glory has nothing to do with us. He's glorious apart from whether or not he's provided for us, whether he's met us or anything. We objectively praise people like, for example, Tom Brady in statements like, Tommy's the greatest athlete in the history of New England sports. And it would make that, that's a declaration of fact. It's a statement. Without Tommy personally impacting us personally, me personally at all in any way. And also, we would never thank, it would make no sense to thank him for being the greatest unless it had to do with us. So that's just, that's a distinction that I think is worth remembering. Praising and thanking are not exactly the same thing. Let's look at verse 5. Come and see what God has done. He is awesome in his deeds toward the children of man. He turned the sea into dry land. They passed through the river on foot. There did we rejoice in him who rules by his might forever, whose eyes keep watch on the nations. Let not the rebellious exalt themselves. The psalmist continues on urging God's people to remind each other what the Lord has done. You remember God's deeds in order to remember how big and powerful he is so that we would praise him. We experience the rhythms of death and resurrection throughout our lives so that we might remember that he is the one and no other who brings dead things, dead relationships, dead ambitions back to life. And our confidence that he is in the resurrection business is grounded because he brought Jesus back to life. It's the purpose of suffering. Remember John 11, Jesus has uh, the sisters, John 11, 3, says the sisters sent to him saying, Lord, he whom you love is ill. Lazarus was about to die. How did Jesus respond? Yes, he waited three days, but what was the reason? Why did he wait? He says, this illness does not lead to death. It is for the glory of God so that the Son of God may be glorified through it. His miracles, his deliverances, his powers on display so that we would see him and praise him and give glory to him. To him. And recalling those things that he's done in the past is so that we don't forget that he is worthy of praise. Verse 8. Bless our God, O peoples. Let the sound of his praise be heard, who's kept our soul among the living and has not let our feet slip. For you, O God, have tested us. You've tried us as silver is tried. As the psalmist encourages us to praise the Lord and then reminds God's people of what the Lord has done for his people as a nation, he gets personal and he leans into a deep theology of sovereignty and suffering, saying that the Lord is responsible for the difficulty and pain in his life. The Lord is responsible for the pain in his life. Which may seem odd because the whole first part of the psalm is reminding us how strong God is, how good he is. So how could he be responsible for all of it? Why would he make statements like the Lord is the one who brought us into the net? The Lord laid a crushing burden on our back. And like we just talked about, 
as Jesus said, the Lord wants us to experience pain and suffering so that it would reveal and cook off all the impurities, all the Christlessness in our lives, and therefore make us more like Jesus so that we would rest more faithfully on him. That's the process of what verse 10 says, testing or trying silver. It's not testing in the way that we take a driving test to see if we pass or fail. It's a cooking process. It's a refining process that God has in his wisdom chosen to be the mechanism by which we are made more like Jesus and over time stop relying on ourselves and our pride and our arrogance. Verse 13, I'll come into your house with burnt offerings. I'll perform my vows to you, that which my lips uttered and my mouth promised when I was in trouble. I will offer to you burnt offerings of fattened animals with the smoke and the sacrifice of rams. I will make an offering of bull, bulls and goats. The psalmist's experience of being tested, tried, and cooked in God's white, hot crucible of holiness, cook the cookery of the white, hot crucible <laughs> that we experience in suffering gave him, the psalmist, an increased awareness of his own sin. The refining process of being made holy by walking through trials, hardships, and difficulty all happens so that this response we see in verses 13 through 15 actually happens. Because the point is that the, the junk bubbles to the top. When it gets cooked, it gets taken off, and then we become pure silver. This is the intended result. The Lord wants to see humility and growing awareness and turning away from sin and turning towards him in worship. That's the whole point of suffering and difficulty so that we would turn from sin, turn to him, and then end in praising him. Verse 16, come and hear all you who fear God and I will tell you what he has done for my soul. I cried to him with my mouth and high praise was on my tongue. If I had cherished iniquity in my heart, the Lord would not have listened, but truly God has listened. He has attended to the voice of my prayer. So remember the Lord brings us through everything he does so that our blinders would be removed and we would see him for who he is. So praise is for him because praising him as king is our affirmation that all is right in the world. That praise is for God and praise is for us. Two takeaways, remember this. But when we suffer and go through hard things, it's really easy to forget that God is king and that all will be right with the world. It's easy to forget that, especially when we feel like we can't like get through the next day. So the psalmist gives us a checklist of three things to do. So these are three mini points in, the, in, the, in our pointless, not pointless sermon, but unpointed, unnumbered. Anyway, I have three points. I have three, three, three things to do when you're in a hard season that the psalmist says, listen, number one, he cried to the Lord with his mouth. Number one, he prayed to God out loud. He didn't just silently pray in the car. Again, nothing against silent prayers in the car. But in this season, he openly prayed out loud to the Lord because he was in agony and God wants us to cry out to him. And what was he crying out with? What was the content of that crying out? Number two, high praise was on my tongue. In his suffering, what did he do? He declared to God, how great God is. We've established this is what we should be saying. This is what praise is. Declaring that God's deeds are mighty and that his enemies come cringing to him. When we're feeling crushed, the last thing we want to do, or the last thing we're even thinking about, is the fact that God is still on the throne. And out loud, declaring those praises to him is what the psalmist did. The other thing is that attempting to praise God rather than thank him in hard times actually puts us in a better place to totally surrender our lives because we don't, when we are not thinking about, oh, I need to thank God for all of this because I'm sure that something good is going to come out of it, which we know, again, is true. We can just focus on praising him for his character because we know that he who didn't spare his own son but gave him up for us all, how will he not also give us, all, give us good things? That's the character of God. So we know that eventually... It will work out. And we can just praise him and say, okay, God, you're God. You're good. You are big. You are really big. 
You parted the, you parted the ocean. You make bitter waters that were killing people sweet because someone, you know, threw wormwood in it. It's like, what? How does that work? God is big and he's great. That's why. We just need to declare it. Point three, the third thing the psalmist does in suffering is, again, he repents. He knows the Lord will not even hear his prayer if he's cherishing sin in his heart, in his heart so he repents, surrenders every part of his life to scrutiny. So three things the psalmist did, cried out to the Lord, verse 17. He praised the Lord, verse 17, and he repented so that God would hear his prayer in verse 18. So at the end of here, verse 20, bless, blessed be God, because he has not rejected my prayer or removed his steadfast love from me. After all this, we know that the Lord does work salvation in our lives. And one of my life verses, and all of my favorite life verses, of my many life verses, in all scripture, Luke 2, chapter 1, A. I'm going to actually memorize it. I don't even need to turn to it. And it came to pass. That's, that's great, isn't it? It didn't come to stay. It came to pass, which is good news. If you're suffering right now, you're in a tough season, you feel confused, maybe hopeless in some ways, we know that that will come to pass. And that's true for every hard season, for every child of God. Either the hard season will pass or we will pass. <laughs> and the Lord's sitting on his throne no matter what. So just like in the fiery furnace, the best thing Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego did was they recognized there was a God. They recognized that the God wasn't them, and their God was on the throne no matter what happened. And they didn't have any fear, stress, anxiety. I mean, maybe they did a little bit, but that's not communicated in the way they talked about it. They said, hey, whether we die or not, God's still God, and he can save us. You can do your worst. doesn't matter. So this is the stability we talked about, just how hopeless and unstable our world is just these constant news cycles. Like I'm just, I wonder what the next thing's gonna be. I'm sure there's gonna be some new, give it, I don't know, a week. Maybe, I've, maybe it's already happened and I don't watch the news, so I don't know, but let me know if something terrible, actually don't let me know, I don't wanna know. But if we have this attitude of praising God and that comes out in the way we talk and we just praise him all the time, that's the stability the world needs. The world needs the stability of a God who doesn't change. So I actually, we don't need to know about all the news stories because we know they're always going to be different. The world needs the message that there is a God who's not them, who does stuff they don't like, but ultimately for it's, his, it's for his glory and for our good. And those two things, his glory and our good, are always hand in hand. So I dare you to take me up on this praise challenge. Obviously, we know that thanking God is a good thing. We should thank God all the time. We should always be living with the spirit of thanksgiving. But for the next couple weeks, I would challenge you to take a specific time every day, whether it's when you wake up, when you go to bed, wherever, eat lunch, whatever it is. I challenge you to praise God for two minutes straight for who he is rather than thanking him for what he's done. And again, I'm assuming that we're all living in spirits of gratitude. But do that, and I think you'll be very blessed by the results, and you'll be very refreshed in your spirit. As far as a book that talks about a lot of this, A.W. Pink wrote a book called Attributes of God. It goes into a lot of depth into who God is, why he's worth praising, why he's worth worshiping. You can also read the Bible. The Bible talks a lot about it too. So I'm going to pray with all of that. Remember, Praising God is for God. Praising God is for us. So praise God. Let's pray. Lord, you reign. Let the earth rejoice. Let the many coastlands be glad. Clouds and thick darkness are all around you. Righteousness and justice are the foundation of your throne. Fire goes before you and burns up your enemies all around your lightnings light up the world. The earth sees and trembles. The mountains, they melt like wax before you, O Lord, before you, the Lord of all the earth. The heavens proclaim your righteousness and all the peoples see, their, see your glory. All worshipers of images are put to shame who make their boast in worthless idols. Lord, may they instead worship you. May they worship you, God. 
Your people hear your word and they rejoice. Because of your judgments, O Lord, they are good. For you, Lord, are most high over all the earth. You are exalted far above all gods. In the name of Jesus, amen.